Two and a half years ago, I attended a conference that changed my life. It actually changed your life as well, even if you don't know it yet. And it will change the course of this planet. In 2015, I attended the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Paris. And this is what I'm here to talk to you about today. What was actually agreed in Paris? What do these goals mean for our economies and for our states? And how can innovation help to reach these goals? This historic meeting did become a personal shift for me as well. At the time, I was working as a reporter, and I was mainly writing about natural gas. I felt guilty writing about gas before I attended, and I felt even worse after I left, because obviously it's a fossil fuel. And it was very moving to be surrounded by indigenous people, activists, and scientists, people from every country on earth working together to come together and find a common climate policy. And they were pushing our leaders to reach a meaningful agreement with ambitious targets. At the same time, I looked at this enormous challenge ahead. So we have to build a fossil-free world. And Paris did become a big awakening for me. I told myself, just writing just isn't enough anymore. So I decided to change my career. And I think each one of us will come to a similar point in our lives where we have to decide, do we strive for money and security or for a job with more moral impact? So shortly after the Paris Agreement, I joined a small startup here in Berlin and we built solar roads. And this is what I'm here to talk to you about more specifically. How can solar roads help us to reach the climate targets? Essentially, they allow us to build large-scale power plants, produce a lot of clean electricity, and therefore reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. So what was actually agreed in Paris? The first target is limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. The problem with this target is that Earth is already one degree warmer. We can see here NASA data that shows the temperature anomalies over the years. And these are increasingly happening. 2016 was the hottest year ever recorded. 2017, last year, was the second hottest year ever recorded. And just a few weeks ago, in Pakistan, temperatures reached over 50 degrees, making it the hottest day on Earth ever in April. So time is really running out for us to still limit the warming to 1.5 degrees. The second target is a consequence. How do we limit the warming? We have to become net zero emissions by mid-century. So our states have to get to a point where we have no more new emissions. That means no more fossil fuels. Coal definitely has to stay in the ground and our economies have to be powered 100% by renewable energy. If we then still have any emissions left from, for example, agriculture, transport, or energy production, we have to offset these emissions by, for example, planting trees. China just started doing that. They deployed 60,000 soldiers just to plant trees to fight the horrible air pollution and fight climate change. And in Pakistan, where I said it's getting really hot, the government, in a period of two years, planted one billion trees to fight climate change and to bring back the rain. So this target, net zero emissions, really had, has wide-reaching consequences for our economies. We have to take decisive actions and restructure our whole economic system. And this is just 30 years away. If we look at how long it takes just to build an airport here in Berlin, I think we should start now. So, these are the two targets. This is what we're trying to achieve. And I just want to show you some important examples that show that there is a monumental shift away from fossil fuels happening already. There is an unprecedented wave of litigation happening. Scientists can now link extreme weather events to climate change. On the other hand, they've mapped out how many emissions have fossil fuel companies emitted over their lifetime. 
and they're putting these pieces together, these pieces of this climate change responsibility puzzle, and they're building stronger cases than ever before. And this coincides with cities facing really high costs for the damage climate change is causing to them right now. There's wildfires in California, sea levels are rising in Florida, and New York City is hit by superstorms. So I thought this was great news. This happened in January. New York City launched a lawsuit against fossil fuel companies. Among them, ExxonMobil, BP, Shell, and others. And they're not the only ones. In San Francisco, there's a similar important case going on right now. And there's cases all over California and the world now. But New York City didn't stop there. They said they will also divest. So they're pulling out $5 billion of investments in the fossil fuel industry. And New York City is not the only city doing that. There's a large institution that said they will also divest. The World Bank announced in December that they will not fund any more oil or gas projects from 2019 onwards. So time is really running out for the fossil fuel companies. And this target I talked about, we have to become net zero emission states, so climate neutral states. These countries already said they will become climate neutral. And you can see they're pretty small countries. But the UK announced that they're working on this target now as well. They will be the first G7 country, so a country with a really large economy, to take this specific Paris target and turn it into national law. And fossil fuels are not just a bad look, they're actually bad business. Prices are falling as we speak. Wind and solar are now the cheapest technologies available. Prices for solar have dropped over 75% in Germany in the last few years. And we can see here with this price learning curve, the more solar we deploy, the cheaper it becomes. So the, no, the only problem now is space. For this grand transition of our economy, we need to, and to reach the Paris targets, we need to use every patch available on Earth to produce clean electricity. And this is what Hans-Joachim Schellenhuber said. I met him a few times at the UN meetings and other events, and he's Germany's most renowned climate scientist. So another example is this. Um, this is Tesla re-establishing the power supply in Puerto Rico. The island was hit by a really devastating hurricane, and it's great they're decreasing their dependence on fossil fuels, but at the same time, is it really smart to put solar panels on a parking lot where cars are actually meant to drive over? So you might see where I'm going with this. Um, wouldn't it be great to have a technology that we can deploy right here? And this is what solar streets allow us to do. Solar streets are taking standard solar technology one step further. They just package it in a different way so that you can walk on it and that you can drive on it. And we can deploy them in areas like I just showed you on that parking lot. And this is what we've been working on. This is a piece of our solar street, and we can see it's very thin. It adapts to the ground that we lay it on. And the surface is so stable that a truck can drive over it and it can stop on it. And it's also slip resistant, which is really important, um, thanks to special minerals that are worked into the top layer. And then underneath this solid glass surface lay highly efficient monocrystalline solar cells, so standard solar cells. And they produce clean electricity. So we expect an energy output of around 100 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And we can see here a close-up of the profile of this solar street, of this module. These grooves capture the sunlight as it moves throughout the day, and they direct it effectively onto the solar cells underneath. And it's designed in a way so that rainwater can drain well, and it's self-cleaning thanks to nano-coating. And we're focusing on electricity production right now, but we're already working on including additional features, like lighting and heating. 
and we can see here a prototype um, that is using LED lighting. So if we install this technology here uh, in Berlin on a bike lane, uh, we can uh, heat it up on a cold winter morning and de-ice the area, and then we can light it up at night to increase the safety for the cyclist. And we've done a study, where do we put all these solar streets? Um, this is a, a city in Germany, and we found that 25% of a city is suitable for the installation of solar streets. So here's the city center marked in red. Um, that's not a good area. There is too much shading, there's too many cars, the buildings are too high, too many trees. But the further outside we go, marked here in yellow and then in green, these are areas that are well suited. So around 25%. And solar streets are already being built across the world. The Netherlands introduced the technology to the world in 2014 when they built the first bike lane. France followed shortly after, and they built one kilometer of highway in the Normandy. And then China followed this year and built a large highway made of solar as well. Some kind of French-inspired design. I don't know if you can see similarities. And then, meanwhile, here in Germany, we're still focusing on coal. Where I'm from, in West Germany, RWE is cutting down a 12,000-year-old forest uh, to produce more coal. They already cut down 90% of it, and they don't want to stop. And this is at a time when we are not reaching our national climate targets, and we're not meet meeting uh, the EU climate targets. We should really, given these ambitious targets to restructure our economies, put more money into clean energy and clean innovation, but we're not. So investments in energy, clean energy, have really dropped dramatically in Germany. We can see highs in 2010 and 2011, when we invested almost $12 billion into um, clean energy. And they've dropped all the way here. This is not the right direction to be going in the situation we're in right now. And the same is true for the installation of solar here. This is how much we installed last year, how many gigawatts of solar was installed in Germany. Um, this is how much we should have installed according to our own national energy law. And this is how much we need to install to reach the Paris climate targets. So, as a small startup in Berlin, how do we move from talking to action? And how can we cross this valley of death? between having a prototype and reaching a mass market. Marina Matsukatu gave a great TED talk about this issue. Um, she's an economist and she advises governments all around the world about the role they play in creating and shaping markets, like Germany has previously done with renewable energy. But we have to continue to do so. Because states really need a direction for their technological change and they need a direction for their growth strategy. Do we want growth at any cost, or do we rather want clean and green growth? And fair enough that every investor is profit-driven, but do we have to be maximum profit-seeking, or can we be happy with less profit and more environmental impact? So where does this leave us? Climate targets have been set, but they have not been yet met. And somebody has to go out there and build this new world now. I personally want to look back on my life and know that I've contributed to making things better. That given everything that we know about polluting industries and climate change, I was on the right side of things. I wasn't just driven by profit, but by helping to build a more sustainable world. And there's certainly a right and a wrong side to be on here. Because destroying our ecosystems and our life support system is not the right side to be on. And I think this increasing and more intensifying climate and environmental crisis is really the fight of our generation, for all of us here. And it comes with great responsibility, but it also comes with great opportunity. Because this century-long grip that the oil industry had is slowly loosening up, as I showed, and it's creating an opening for all of us to participate and help to build a more sustainable world. So, I'm in it to change the game. The only question is, are you? Thank you.